to the latest episode of Melon's Better Driving videos. Uh, this time, by request of my friend Omar, we're going to be discussing confidence, and essentially with that confidence is going to come the... how should I say this? The level of fear that you want to overcome versus the amount of bravery that you have, the amount of confidence that you have, or the amount of arrogance that you have, because I've seen everything in terms of racing. I've seen those who are way too confident and way, way, way too just all over the track, but they're not listening to reason within their own brain. They're saying, well, I've heard that Mario Andretti said that if, if you're in control and everything feels like you're in control, then you're not driving fast enough. Yeah, but that's Mario Andretti. And what he's talking about is slip angle and neutral steer, which I've posted a video from another channel, a guy who uh, happens to call his YouTube channel How to Become a Racing Driver. That video will tell you about what he's talking about which is separate from the idea of being overconfident because overconfidence is not a good thing within racing but it's gonna happen I guess there's people who are just overly brave just outright they set out and that almost seems to be their goal within a race weekend or whatever is to be the guy who makes the highlights real at all costs and that's great if you want sponsors, but it's not great if you're trying to actually put those sponsors towards affording stuff that you're not going to break. But, anyways, with all of that aside, let me just start off by saying that if you want to overcome fear, the best way to do that is experience. And I'm not just saying that as a person who's done racing for a long time but rather a person who has studied psychology and more specifically sports psychology. I'm not going to say that I have some university degree in it or anything, no. But what I am going to say is that I've read through some books and some findings and everything by a doctor by the name of Mihail Cench Mihaili, who was, I guess, born in Hungary and then traveled the world to discuss his discovery within the world of psychology which is called flow. Flow, the psychological term, is essentially a way of describing the perfect performance of a top-level athlete when they're doing what they are trained to do and they enjoy doing. And this passion and this drive and this everything that separates the psychology of an average person from the psychology of a racing driver or whatever. That is the biggest point within flow and so on, is that you have to have the passion for it, you have to enjoy it, you have to find it a challenge. There's a whole bunch of steps that are required. You have to set goals, you have to do this, you have to do that in order to find your flow. But a lot of it comes down to experience, because a lot of these people, they will set these goals based on the experience that they have and what they know that they need to do in order to accomplish the tasks that they set out to do. So in the case of somebody who's trying to win a gold medal, they will set not just the goal of winning a gold medal. In the case of, let's say, X Games Rally, X Games Rally Cross. They'll say, okay, I need to hit that apex at turn two better because that's where I'm losing time. And then they're going to nail that apex. They're going to nail that apex. And they're going to nail that apex. It's going to feel so good for them that the mind will reward itself 
with continually thinking further and further ahead and this is sort of what Senna was discussing, Ayrton Senna, when he was discussing the feeling of being two or three or four seconds ahead of real time. He was ahead of time. And it's not so much time travel so much as it is a psychological phenomenon of being prepared for what's going to happen by literally guessing. But your brain isn't guessing, it's drawing from the previous experience that it has and that's what it uses and your brain sort of goes on to autopilot but it's not autopilot because every thought that you have is a conscious thought but it's a subconscious thought at the exact same time because you're not planning it as if it is in fact a conscious thought but it's there it takes up some of your thought processing and capabilities and so on and you're not like literally on autopilot the car is driving for you but you feel like that because you're not focused 100% on the task at hand except in terms of cognitive function you are focused on it 100% but it's in a different way from the way that most people actually focus on something 100%. If the people are focused on something that's 100%, then a lot of times it's because they're focused on that thing and that thing only. But racing drivers, when they're experiencing their flow, let's say they're on a qualifying lap, then... Wow. Uh, pit lane, exit. Just had to show me doing that, didn't it? Um, anyways. You get to the point where flow comes from experience because you've done it so many times that you know how to do it and so the mind will fill in the gaps and you'll be able to think ahead and thinking ahead gives you that four seconds of whatever you want to call it, buffering time let's say, where you can plan ahead, think it out, plan it out, figure out what you're going to do and in that period of time you'll be able to decide about is there a better line or whatever you'll be able to plan everything through and that's the idea behind flow is that you're still using 100 percent of your brain power but it happens so subconsciously that you don't realize that you're focused 100 percent but you get into this euphoric state where everything in the world melts away it just it all melts away you don't have any unnecessary thoughts anything that would ever distract you from anything except winning the race getting the pole position hitting your apex whatever you set your goal to be that is what you experience flow when you're trying to accomplish that and that is a lot of what confidence is in terms of an actual driving approach to confidence because I feel like there's a lot of people out there who just say that racing is a conscious thing that people are thinking about it like thinking about their apexes and thinking about this they're thinking about that but that exact thought that you have even though it's technically correct and you're like, you should be thinking about your apexes and stuff. If you have to think about it, if you have to set your mind to it and say to yourself, you know what, I could really do that better, I could hit that apex better, I could do this better, I could do that better. If you're thinking to yourself and you're saying that to yourself, then you're not at the top level because every one of the... Uh, the top level drivers in the world they're not thinking about that as they're driving they're in the state of flow that their concentration is so bang on that literally they can have this full conversation with their team engineer or crew chief or whatever and it sounds like they're just having the most relaxed Sunday drive of their life in actuality, they're driving 210 miles per hour in a Formula One car. Why is that? It's because they're so into the focus, so into the zone, so into this flow, 
this psychological effect that they don't have to think about driving that it comes naturally to them because their brain is thinking four or five seconds ahead and their the imagery of the mind is three or four or five seconds ahead and when the imagery of the mind is three or four or five seconds ahead then your understanding of physics is deepened but not with conscious thought that you think you know E equals MC squared and so that means blah no it's not a physical thought so much as it is a subconscious thought that you think this is how the car is going to react that's my breaking point but you're planning it you're seeing it you're visualizing it three four five seconds ahead so in the case of like the car that we're riding along with right now they're already at that yellow curb on the inside they're already on that right and wet Blah, red and white curb there they're already passed through the next corner they're already looking all the way into that next corner so they're planning it that far ahead that's the difference between a racing driver and a sporting driver and the person who just drives to work there and back it's the amount of flow that the person finds, the amount of subconscious thought that they don't even think about driving, it just comes naturally to them. That they've set their goals, they've set everything, they've gotten everything figured out. The idea behind it is that the people who just drive to work there and back, they're always thinking about driving. They're not just doing it because of instincts and habit unless they have enough experience to the point that it becomes easy for them in which case then that's when it becomes conceit if it's not kept in check but there's a fine line between this where you have on one side being timid or being uncertain of how to accomplish the task that you set out for yourself that's the something that a new driver would feel that's something that a new racing driver would feel, that's something that a new driver on the street would feel. But you can't allow that to happen because that's timidness and that's going to cause you to be confused and distracted and almost dazzled within your response to the requirements of driving the car. The opposite end of that spectrum, however, is even more dangerous because it's when you start to take things for granted it's arrogance it's conceit it's i'm so good i don't have to think about this i don't have to break here i can break later than this i can do this i can do that and that's exactly when you're going to find yourself hitting a patch of ice that you didn't plan for because you just took it for granted that you had the grip and you break late and now you're off and you hit the wall or you hit the snowbank or you hit the tree you did whatever you did your car is totaled you might be injured some spectators might be injured you never know what actually could happen with something like that but the idea is that if you want to perform well within a race within anything along those lines you have to find your flow or be relatively close to your flow that you know what you want to accomplish and how to accomplish it and you set your goal there and you set forth in order to accomplish it sadly this is the problem that many 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 people have it's that they don't find this flow but they plan everything half a second in advance or even less they drive reactively instead of planning how they want to drive and this advice comes not just from the standpoint of finding your racing line although it's very important for that but you have to picture it as well that if you're trying to find your racing line when you attempt to find your racing line you're planning that ahead what happens when you try a different racing line you find out there's no grip you have understeer and you have oversteer and the car is squirming around because of a lack of grip on that line that you've chosen in an attempt to find more time on the track you have to respond but if you're 
consciously thinking about the response that you have to make to the car in order to keep it under control, then you're wasting time because your subconscious thought happens like four tenths of a second faster. To, to consciously think, oh no, my car is sliding, I have to counter steer. You're already too late because you can't have that as a conscious thought. You have to just feel it and then your brain will just, oh, oversteer, quick, correct. And even that, it's still, when I'm saying it, it takes so long, but your subconscious mind will, how do I say this, respond so much more quickly to subconscious thoughts than to conscious thought. That is flow. That's what Ayrton Senna did. That is how you find your confidence level. That's how you find your ideal balance between being timid and being conceited and arrogant. In the middle, that's where the racing driver will drive, where they know I cannot attempt to force the issue to pass this person in this corner. This is a stupid thing and I shouldn't do it. But it happens because people try to make these passes happen. They find themselves desperate. They find that they're not meeting their goals. They find that they're, they're losing their flow and they have to try to get past this person. And that's when the mistakes happen. But I'm going to tell a story now, which happened from my own racing career, back when I was karting. I was at the Most Sport karting track. Uh, back then it was still called Most Sport, don't tell me it's called Canadian Tire Motorsports Park. I'm telling a historical story about a historical track which happened to be called Most Sport back then. Okay, I'm at that kart track, I'm racing against a very friendly woman, a very attractive, amazing woman, you know? She's somebody that I would hang out with now if I still knew who she was, but sadly I don't. Anyways, it's aside from the story, but I was astonished that I was finishing second time and time and time again to this girl. I'm like, what's your secret? And she says, oh, um, I go full throttle through turn one. And I looked at her, I'm like, I don't believe that, but I'll try it. And she looks at me like, of course I do. Clearly, like, it's obvious, you should know that. And so the next session comes along, and this is a qualifying session, so I think, you know what? This is the perfect, se this is the perfect session for me to try. This is the perfect opportunity for me to try that. This is the best opportunity that I will have to attempt to beat her, start pole, run away with the race lead from the start. And I go out there and I try it because she said, yeah, you can do it like full throttle through turn one. And I go out there and I ignore my fear. I ignore the voice in my head that says, hey, that's really stupid. Don't do that. And the reason why I did that is because I had the faith in what she had told me being that you could take this corner full throttle. And I tried it. And I just messed it up badly. I uh, left the track, I spun 180 degrees, pinned the throttle, got it 180 degrees around again, so I was going in the same direction. Like, that lap was a throwaway lap, I lost three seconds on that qualifying lap. But, I realized she's lying to me, there's no way. So, I come to the end of the qualifying session, I get second again behind her again because she's actually a better driver than me and <laughs> she was the only one who was faster than me that day and it was just frustrating to be behind her session after session after session by only a tenth of a second here, a tenth of a second there. But I ask her. Why did you tell me that you could take that first corner full throttle? I tried it, and now you, you couldn't. And she says, oh, wait, you tried it in that corner, 
but I thought that you meant turn one of the second sector. And I look at her like, no, that corner, it's obvious that it's full throttle through that corner. Like, everybody's going full throttle through there, even the people who are at the very back of the field. And, well, it kind of got to the point that I was a little bit sort of confused about how she still had that time because she told me something that was completely obvious and I looked at her like you're telling me that that's your secret which is something that's completely obvious and, comp and uh, to this day I still don't know about what she was doing to improve her lap time and I think she was not telling me in order to win the race which that's completely fair, completely awesome of her, because that's her competitive edge. And I can respect that she didn't want to give it to me, but I was just wondering, because it was my first day at the track, so I was still picking up on a whole bunch of things throughout the day. And if there was one thing that I was missing, I wanted to know it, just because that was my first time out there. And... Essentially race time came and I just went back to driving as I did and found my flow again and I got second place which that's not bad I've got a medallion from it I, you know I uh, had a pretty good race and ended up on the podium between two lovely ladies like what's wrong with that but it goes to show you though that her flow that she's not necessarily consciously thinking about how she's driving but it's more of a subconscious almost reflex like reflexive drive that she's just nonchalantly this that's how I did that yeah that I don't know but I did it and I'm faster than you and she's just sort of nonchalant about it and I trying desperately to catch up to her and she's just nah it's easy no, nothing to nothing to worry about. No big concerns, nothing like that. And it makes me sort of wonder, like, uh, how much better is this subconscious thought that leads you to finding that perfect amount of arrogance, conceit, and timidness and cowardice that when you blend those two and mesh those two together, you find your perfect amount of both in order to maintain complete control of everything within the situation that your mind subconsciously begins to just figure stuff out without problem and it sounds completely irrelevant to have discussion of the psychology of finding your flow in terms of trying to figure out how confident to be but racing isn't necessarily about confidence the way that people think it is if you're actually consciously thinking about the trees that you're flying past or the walls that you're flying past you're gonna chicken out but you're not thinking about the trees you're not thinking about the walls you're not thinking about the grass at the side of the track what you're thinking about is what you need to do to get around that corner more quickly than the car in front of you. That's all you're thinking about. If you stop to think about anything that's at the side of the track or the fight you had with your ex fiance or your wife or whatever, if you stop to think about any of that stuff, you're going to lose the race simply because somebody out there is in a better psychological state and will have better control over the car because they've found that flow and that psychological phenomenon called flow. But the important takeaway from this is that it's not about the size of your genitalia, okay? That's not the reason why you're going to be faster or slower. I could go on for days and days and days and days and days about how many times people have asked me if my nickname is Melons because of the size of my genitalia. No. Okay, I'm a normal human being. My nickname comes from a very different thing. 
then it's an entirely irrelevant story from this. But, if people see me driving and they say, oh my god, you drive like a lunatic, you drive crazy, like, don't you feel fear? I'm like, no. Why would I feel fear? And they would say, you must have huge melons. I'm like, no. No, like, the size of your genitalia does not determine how brave you are. What determines how brave you are is essentially either stupidity, clinical psychosis, nihilism, or knowing how to do what you were challenged to do without experiencing a crash or some type of an injury or something like that where a lot of people they're throwing knives or they're walking into battle or what's another thing throwing chainsaws and juggling chainsaws like all these things that people think are things that are bravery no, these people, they worked up to that. They didn't just suddenly pick up a chainsaw, start it up, and start juggling it. They didn't. They started juggling with bowling pins to start with. I guarantee it. Or tennis balls. And then they suddenly said, you know what? I want to try something different. And then they said, let's try hockey pucks. Let's try this, let's try that. And they're going to continually work up to it. And then, to, at the end of it, I should say, when they start to get to the point where they feel comfortable with throwing these running chainsaws that could split them open into God knows how many pieces. Um, sorry for mentioning religion, by the way, but... That's not because the person is thinking like, oh, I want to do something that's ultra dangerous, but they're thinking, I've got this, it's fine. I've done this before, but I've done it with a different object. Now I'm just going to compensate for the weight distribution of the chainsaw being different, like, and I'm going to do this differently, I'm going to do that differently. I don't know about how to juggle chainsaws, but the example is the same, that you're not going to hop into a race car and run your full throttle laps without slowly working yourself up over a couple of months or a couple of years trying to find out how to overcome that fear without freaking out and crashing or how to rein in the confidence so that you don't crash. You have to find that flow and that's the only advice that I can really say about how to be confident as a driver without being conceited as a driver is to find your limit within experience. So it's not about going out at your first track day and proving that you're the greatest, the fastest, the best at everything ever and that obviously Ayrton Senna should be jealous of you because no. No, you're not going to go out and suddenly make people think that you're the best driver in the world. Everybody knows you've got people like Ayrton Senna, Sebastian Vettel, Sebastian Loeb, um, Scott Pruitt, any of these guys. All these people with all these multiple championships, Michael Schumacher, all these people they did not go out to their first track day when they were like 21 and suddenly blow everybody's doors off. They started racing when they were three, like I think Scott Pruitt did, or four, like Sebastian Vettel, or six, like Sh Michael Schumacher, I think it was. They started at this young age. And they worked up in confidence, and they worked up in talent, and they worked up in driver experience, and they worked up in their ability to find that flow that comes when they're performing well. And that's the only piece of advice that I can give you if you are having trouble with confidence levels. The 
only thing to tell anybody about confidence is that confidence can get you into trouble before anything else. Yeah, I have so many rally friends, I have so many touring car friends, I've got these friends, I've got that friends, you know, I've been around motorsports. And there are a lot of times when people will tell me, you know, I got carried away. I went into that corner too fast and I carried too much speed in and I really should have reconsidered doing that before I did it. But it's because they fell out of that flow, they fell out of the rhythm and they decided to try to find it again by making a silly mistake. But they didn't consciously make that decision. What happened was they stopped driving subconsciously without realizing that they stopped driving subconsciously. The conscious thought began to take over, and conscious thought takes so much longer than it does for subconscious thought to take effect. Your subconscious is so much quicker in terms of the reflex of sliding or falling or anything along those lines that you feel like hey I'm not in control anymore where if you lean back in your chair the wrong way your reflex oh my god I'm falling is super quick you're just instantaneously back up and your heart rate just skyrockets you shouldn't consciously think oh no I'm falling over I should lean forward no that was a subconscious reflex. Okay, somebody pops out from behind a bathroom door with a knife. What's your reflex? You jump back, you don't even think about it because you were startled. Subconscious thoughts are always faster than conscious thoughts. A lot of times, that's what's happening with the people with the Black Lives Matter versus police. Sometimes the police are just acting on the subconscious thought because they're so, so nervous or so this or so that that the subconscious thought is essentially the same as like somebody doing one of those jerk reflex tests to see if you're paying attention or to see if they can startle you. But they're armed with a gun and that all it takes is just that one little oops they flinch and flinching like that pulls the trigger that you can't have the wrong subconscious thought you have to have it with experience but experience costs money to obtain it's difficult to obtain you have to do it there is no alternative to experience there is no alternative to finding your psychological phenomenon of flow there is nothing else that compares to it. If sports psychology didn't matter, people wouldn't study it, and people wouldn't make an effort to attempt to get everything going along those same lines, where the people wouldn't try to pay these, psych these um, sports psychologists big, big money in order to try to win these gold medals and so on. It wouldn't make sense. But it does make sense, because it's true science. That's why it's studied, that's why it exists. And that is how you overcome fear within racing. That is how you overcome fear, period. And it's not the size of your genitalia. That's been an episode of Melon's Better Driving. Subscribe if you want, like the video, share it around if you want. Uh, also check out our website soon, because uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of articles coming up. Um, a lot like this one, but better. Have a good one.